Well, this is the weekend that we celebrate our independence. Our independence from Britain, bad dentistry, and bad food. Uh, but good news is, you know, we got fish and chips in the divorce, so, you know, I'm still happy about that. But the question I want to consider with you today is, what if we're not truly free? What if the kind of freedom that you and I experience is not the kind of freedom that God intended for human beings to live in? What if we're not truly free? I'll give you an example. When I get home from work, my dog, Sky is usually there waiting for me, and she is super happy to see me, um, and comes and, you know, is jumping and very happy to see me, but as soon as she greets me, she immediately makes a beeline for the back door, because my guess is, her thinking is, I have been imprisoned in this house all day, I want to be free, so she will stand at the back door, and she'll be going, <laughs> You know, and she's just like, oh, I, I, I want to get out. I want to be free. I want to go, right? And so immediately I uh, 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 appease her, and she bolts out the back door. And she is free. She is like a dog released from doggy Alcatraz. And she is ready to go, and the wind is blowing through her fur, and she, her tongue is hanging out the side of her mouth. She is free for about 15 feet when she remembers that we have a fenced-in backyard. And she is not truly free. And in about 30 seconds later, she turns around and comes back to the back door wanting to get back inside. I actually think it's because she forgets that she lives in Alabama and she's like, it is hot out here. Let me in, right? Now, my earliest recollection of freedom was when I was five years old and I went on my first ever class field trip and my mother gave me $10 to, so that I would be able to buy my lunch at the uh, field trip that, that I was going on. Now, I had never seen that kind of cash as a five-year-old. And I looked at this $10 and I thought, oh my goodness, I am free to buy anything. Because you know what? I can have lunch any day. But to have $10 to buy whatever I want to buy. And I'm just envisioning myself going, I mean, I'm thinking with $10, I should be able to buy out an entire candy store, right? Because, you know, at five, that's really what you're thinking about is candy, right? And so I am free to be Willy Wonka himself with my $10. Now, unfortunately, the field trip went to a museum, and so there was no candy shop. But I went in there, and my eyes set, set their gaze on astronaut ice cream. I thought to myself, wow, I get to eat the same dessert that the astronauts ate in space. Little did I know that it really only is a piece of chalk with some sugar on it. But I ripped open that astronaut ice cream and bit into that sugary drywall substance. But I was free to enjoy my $10. Isn't it ironic? We're, we're, I'm an adult now. I could buy as much candy as I want, but I don't because of obesity and diabetes and root canals, right? But we think we're free, but we're not really free. My next recollection of freedom was when I turned 17 because growing up in New Jersey, 17 was the age you needed to be in order to operate an automobile on your own without an annoying parent sitting next to you telling you, watch out for the potholes, watch out for the potholes, right? And so I went down to the DMV. I got an appointment on the very first appointment on the day of my birthday. I took the day off of school so that I could get my driver's license. So I headed down to the DMV, and I waited and waited and waited for my appointment because we all know the DMV is where happiness goes to die. <laughs> but eventually, I got my chance and I had the opportunity to get behind the wheel and to take my driving test. I passed first time and so I quickly took my mom home because, you know, she had to drive me there. Um, and I took my mom home, dropped her off, and I thought to myself, I'm free! Finally! 
Finally, I am free. I have the car for the day. And I took off. I drove down the end of our block. And I stopped. And I thought to myself, where am I going to go? All my friends were in school, right? Because I took the day off of school, so they're all in school, and I'm free, so I drove around and around. And then I pulled into the parking lot of a grocery store because, you know, that's what free guys like to do, you know? I mean, I was envisioning, right, the windows rolled down, the music up, the wind in my hair, you know, the open road, here I am at a grocery store, walking up and down aisles, bought myself a pack of gum, went home. See, what if we're not truly free? Or what if what we think is freedom is not truly freedom? The way that God designed for freedom to be. Is it possible that you and I could be living in the most free country in the entire planet and still be held back, be missing out on freedom. Freedom the way God designed for freedom to be experienced. So the question I want to think through with you is what is true freedom? What is true freedom? And could you and I today be missing out on that true freedom. If you have a Bible with you today, I would love for you to join me in the book of Galatians, Galatians chapter five. If you're using a mobile device, I'll be using the New International Version, the NIV. So if you have a mobile device and you can look up the NIV. Galatians chapter five, beginning with verse one. And Galatians, by the way, is a letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to a church in a place called Galatia. So this is a group of Christians. They, they gather just like we're gathering today here on a Sunday. They would gather and they would hear the reading of this letter. So this is a letter that Paul is writing to people who are already in the church. And he says this, Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is... For freedom, there's our word, that Christ has set us free. So Paul starts off right away and says, there's a kind of freedom that is only possible through Jesus Christ, and that part of the reason why Jesus came and died on a bloody cross for your sin and my sin was to set us free. And so Paul says, it is for this kind of freedom, the kind of freedom that only God can give us, that Christ came to set us free. But then notice what he says next. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Wait a second, Paul. You just said that Christ came to set us free. But then he says, don't let yourself be burdened by slavery. So there's a possibility to be somebody who attends church, who maybe even would say that they're a Christian, a follower of God, and yet allow ourselves to be slaves again. Meaning we can put our faith and trust in Jesus. We can pray a prayer. We can become a Christian, a follower of God. We can read our Bible every day. We can go to church every Sunday and still miss out on freedom. We can still inadvertently let ourselves become slaves again. Well, what do you mean, Paul? Well, what he's about to lay out in the rest of this chapter is two ways that you and I can still find ourselves enslaved, missing out on the freedom that Christ came to give us. And the first way he's going to mention to us is that we become slaves to legalism. The first way that you and I can miss out on the freedom that Christ came, it came to give us is that we become slaves to legalism. We say, well, where do you get that? Well, let's keep reading. Verse 2. Mark my words. I, Paul, tell you 
that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he's obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. Now, he's using this concept of circumcision to be an indicator of someone who follows the law. What he's saying is that you can attend church, you can be, be a Christian, who in your attempt to be transformed, in your attempt to be changed, in your attempt to be more like Jesus, in an attempt to be more Christian, if you will, that you can actually go down this path of trying to do the right thing, because that's really what we mean by keeping the law. Paul says that you, if you do this, if you try to become transformed and free and live as a Christian using the law, that you're going to find yourself enslaved again. You're going to find yourself in prison again. And you say, wait a second, what are you talking about? I'm talking about, and I don't know if this is hitting you like it hit me when I read this, I this is what I spent my whole life doing, right? Is being a good Christian boy and then being a good Christian man. And some of you, this is your story. You have spent your whole life trying to do the right thing, trying to be a good person, trying to live up to what the Bible tells you, right? To, to, not, to not drink, to not smoke, to not chew, and not go with girls who do, right? <laughs> Right? That, that, that's, what, that's what they used to say, right? Like, this is what it means. You're going to live the life of a, of a Christian. You've got to do all the right things. And what Paul says is if you're looking to do the right things, that it's not going to actually change who you are. It's not going to change your heart. You see, the law is very helpful in certain things, but the law cannot change a messed up heart. The law can't change a messed up heart. So you can, that you can set a law that you should not murder. And that will actually be pretty effective at keeping people from murdering each other. For most of us, if we know it's against the law to murder somebody, we're not gonna go and murder somebody. The law can be very effective at keeping people from murdering one another. But the law can do nothing about our anger. The law can do nothing about our resentment and our hatred. See, the law can't get to our heart. And anger and hatred and resentment are at the very root of murder. So the law is effective at keeping everybody what we would call um, uh, moral um, reformation or, or moral constrainment, right? We want to live as moral people. The law is very effective at keeping us moral, keeping us good boys and good girls, but it doesn't affect our heart. So you can set a law against stealing, but the law can't deal with jealousy and envy which is at the root of stealing. Do you see the problem we have here? So what Paul is saying is if you spend your life trying to be a good person and do all the good things, you will very quickly find yourself enslaved to legalism, to moral constraint, which isn't helpful. And when you try to get somebody to be transformed or changed, through the law, all you're going to do is produce in people, or you're going to take away people's um, uh, joy. You're going to take away people's joy. You're going to take away um, their peace. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, think about parents. You, you remember this. Remember the times when your kids were really young, and you wanted to help your, your child do the right thing, and they asked you that lovely question that every kid asks, well, why? Why should I do that? 
And as good parents, what did we tell them? Because if you do that wrong thing, you're gonna get caught. You're gonna get in trouble. You're gonna get caught by me, you're gonna get caught by your teacher, you're gonna get caught by the police, you're gonna get caught definitely by God, and he's gonna see that, and you shouldn't do that because you're gonna get caught. Or we'll say something like, if you do that wrong thing, no one's gonna like you. It's gonna upset other people. Your sister's gonna be upset with you if you do that kind of thing. And you will begin to, de- you will be despised by other people. We may not say that to a child, but, and you're gonna begin to despise yourself. You're gonna feel like you aren't really a good person. And you're gonna feel badly about yourself. So what do we, as good loving parents, use to try to motivate our kids to do the right thing? We use pride and fear. <laughs> Don't wanna get caught, right? He, he sees you when you're sleeping. He knows when you're awake. If you mess up, Santa's not gonna give you any presents, right? This is, this is our tactic. So what happens is we, we create these children who are these tiny bundles of anxiety, right? Walking around, oh, I don't wanna mess up. I don't wanna make a mistake. I don't wanna do the wrong thing because I'm gonna get caught and I'm gonna get in trouble and I'm gonna be despised by others. I don't even know what that means. And, and I'm gonna despise myself. So what happens is even though you may get a child to do the right thing, you're doing it at the expense of their joy and their peace. And those good little boys and good little girls grow up to be good men and good women who who now are focused on people-pleasing and worrying all the time and perfectionism and people who don't experience joy. And they come to our churches and sit in seats and listen to another sermon telling them that they need to keep being good. And Paul is saying, all you are is imprisoned to legalism, imprisoned to doing all the right thing. Now, I know some will protest and say, what do you mean? I have the joy of the Lord. I have lots of joy, right? where you feel like saying, well, could you tell your face? Because you might, <laughs> you might be telling me you have joy, but the way you're walking around, it's not so joyful, not so free. And this is how I spent most of my life as a Christian. Afraid, anxious, lacking that freedom. And yet, promoted in youth group and given opportunities to um, be in charge of things. Why? Because I was a good little boy doing all the right things. And Paul says, if you go down this path, you will find yourself a slave to legalism and people-pleasing and perfectionism, trying to do the right things and yet not being free. You're trading one form of slavery for another. Well, then you say, well, well, fine, we'll... Uh, maybe legalism isn't the way I'm going to find freedom. Well, Paul then addresses the second way that we sometimes, particularly in our society, get imprisoned, and that is we become slaves to liberalism. Slaves to li- Now, I'm not speaking here of politics. I'm talking about liberalism in the sense of free to do whatever you want to do. Paul addresses this in verse 13 of Galatians 5. Take a look at it with me. He says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free. But do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. Skip down to uh, verse 17. He says, For the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you do not do whatever you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. The acts of the flesh are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, and debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, dissensions, factions, and envy, and drunkenness, orgies, and the like. Dot, 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 etc., 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 right? He says, I warn you, as I did before, that those who live like this 
will not inherit the kingdom of God. So he says, if you go the other way, which is, I'm not going to be a good person. I'm going to do whatever I want to do. Paul says, before you know it, you're going to find yourself enslaved to your own flesh, to your own desires. Somewhere be, um, before the Enlightenment, freedom had a, or right around the Enlightenment, freedom got redefined. You see, freedom, as it's spoken of in the Bible, and as everyone in society viewed it before the Enlightenment, freedom was always viewed as freedom from. Freedom from oppression. Right? So the Israelites were, were slaves in Egypt, and Moses comes to say, set my people free. What was he saying? He was essentially saying, free them from oppression, the oppression of Pharaoh. And so freedom, up until the Enlightenment, was always defined as freedom from either external oppression or even internal oppression. Somewhere after the Enlightenment, our society redefined the word freedom, and it was no longer freedom from, it now is freedom to. So now, the way most of our society views freedom means I am free to do whatever I want to do. I am free to pursue whatever I want to pursue. I am free to indulge in whatever I want to indulge in. I am free to pursue, to sleep with, to buy, to sell, to say whatever I want to say, to have whatever opinion I want to have, as long as it doesn't hurt someone else. Right? That's the way our society lives today. When you think of freedom, you think, I am free to do whatever I want to do and what Paul is saying here is if you define freedom as as going forward and just indulging in whatever your heart's desires are you will very quickly find yourself enslaved to those desires you will find yourself enslaved to your flesh Meaning you will begin to say, whatever I want to do is no longer what I want to do. Now I have to do it. And so what's going on in our culture today, and we know this, is everybody's addicted to everything. That thing that they thought, I'm just doing what I want to do, now I have to do it. And so we have people addicted to drugs and alcohol and addicted to sex and addicted to work and addicted to relationships and addicted to the next high, the next exhilarating experience, addicted to whatever it is. We have a culture right now that is addicted to everything. So what I want to do, what I'm free to do, I'm no longer free. I now have to do these things. And this is what the Apostle Paul's warning us of. He says, if you try to find freedom by just indulging your flesh and just doing whatever you want, very quickly you will be imprisoned all over again. And you will not inherit the kingdom of God. As Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 19, he says, you are slaves to whatever masters you. People are slaves to whatever mastered them. So, you and I, maybe in, a, maybe in a very simplistic way, let me just say it this way, some of us will say, I had to have seconds. You know, I mean, I was a guest at their house. I had to have seconds. I had to have dessert. I mean, you know, it's just not good when you have a meal and you've got to have something sweet afterwards. I have to have dessert. Or I have to watch another episode of that show. I know I have to get up early tomorrow, but you know, the way it was just left on that cliffhanger, one more episode, right? My wife Amy and I, this is our story. (laughs) Every time we sit down, we're just gonna watch one today. No, I have to watch another one, right? And again, that's in a very simple, maybe silly way, but we have to. Paul says, you're not free. You're not experiencing the kind of freedom that I have for you or that God has for you. Because you are now slave to your desires, to indulging your desires. So, you and I, people who go to church, remember, he's writing this to Christians. He's writing this to church people. And he's saying, mark my words. You can go down the path of trying to do all the right things and be a good person, and you will become a slave 
to legalism. Or you can go down the path of just indulging your own flesh and you will become a slave to your flesh. Both of these things will make you miss out on what God has for you. I hope that's blessed your soul. Let's close in prayer. And uh, (laughs) no, I actually have some really good news. Actually, Paul has some very good news for us. And that is, how do you and I then live in the true freedom that Christ came to purchase for us? How do you and I find true freedom? Look with me back at verse 16 of Galatians 5. So Paul says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Oh, so I won't become a slave to my own impulses and my own flesh. He says, no, if you walk by the Spirit, you will not gratify the desires of your flesh. Okay, all right, that's, that's really great, Paul. But, but what about the legalism thing? What about trying to do all the right things? Well, he says, go down to verse 18. But if you are led by the Spirit... You're not under the law. Oh, I don't have to live in a way of trying to earn God's approval. I don't have to live in a way of trying to get God to love me more or being afraid that God's gonna somehow love me less. He says, no, if you led by the Spirit, you're not under the law anymore. And then he goes on, verse 22. Well, well, Paul, what does this look like? What is this life that you're inviting me into? What do I get to experience? Well, look at verse 22. But, he says, the fruit of this spirit, this is what comes out if you decide to walk this path of freedom, is love and joy and peace. Oh, I'm not missing out on joy and peace anymore. No. Forbearance or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Right? We, we can't set laws to change hearts. Right? There can't be a law like you're not allowed to worry. If you're caught worrying, we're throwing you in jail. Right? All the anxiety people, you're in jail. Right? No, you can't do that. He says these kinds of things are heart things. And the kind of freedom that Christ came to give you is a freedom that comes from the inside out legalism comes from the outside in and the thinking is if I get everybody to do all the right things somehow eventually their heart will be changed and Paul says no all you do is you enslave those people to the right behaviors you have exercised moral constraint trying to hold them back from doing bad things that they actually miss out on the kind of freedom that Christ brings through his spirit. You see, gospel transformation is different than moral reformation. Gospel transformation is different than moral reformation. So how do we find this kind of freedom? Well, let's keep reading. Those who belong to Christ Jesus, verse 24, have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires since we live by the spirit Let us keep in step with the Spirit. So three things, three ways you and I can begin to move towards the kind of freedom that God came to bring us. First is this. We have to receive the Spirit. We have to receive the Spirit. Meaning we can't earn it. We can't be good enough for it. We can't show up at church enough times to earn it, to get that, get that little sticker that we get in vacation Bible school. You did it. We can't do that when it comes to the Spirit. The Spirit can only be received. Meaning I have to come before God humbly and admit I can't do it. I can't make my own way. I can't make it happen for me. That there's nothing I can do to get God to love me any more than he loves me right now. And there's nothing I can do to get God to love me any less than he loves me right now. That his grace and his love for me is not based on what I do. It's based on who I am. I am loved by him for God so loved Jason. Oh, and the rest of the world. (laughs) Right? For God so loved the world. That includes you. Put your name there. 
that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him, whoever receives Jesus, receives his spirit. So when you, at that second that you become a believer in Jesus, when you step across that line of faith, when you say, I'm no longer gonna trust in me and my um, good works, and I'm gonna transfer my trust to Jesus who died on the cross for my sin, even my attempts at religion and behavior modification, he died for it all. And now I just transfer my trust and I choose to trust fully in what Jesus did for me. At the second that happens, the Bible says I receive the Holy Spirit. I receive the Spirit. So don't try to be transformed if you don't have the Spirit. That's the first thing. You've got to know, have I come to the point in my life where I have received the Spirit? Once that's happened, second thing Paul says is you need to crucify the flesh. He says you have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So we need to crucify the flesh. Now, it's interesting, the word he uses here is crucify. He doesn't say we electrocute the flesh or we stab the flesh, or we shoot the flesh, or we blow up the flesh. We crucify the flesh. Well, if you know anything about crucifixion, crucifixion is one of the most slowest forms of death. In fact, that criminal who is hung up on a cross is hung up to die. And many times people just leave that person hanging there, and eventually they die not because of the wounds, but because they can't catch their breath, they get so weak. They keep trying to lift their bodies to breathe, and they get over and over, and eventually they die of asphyxiation. So this is good news, because what Paul is saying is, your flesh, it's gonna take some time. So give yourself some grace, because your flesh is crucified. So we are not going to crucify the flesh by our willpower, by white-knuckling it, by trying to do all the right things. To crucify the flesh means that we are letting him change us from the inside out. And so I found in my own journey, and this is kind of some new breakthroughs for my own thinking as a Christian, I found um, great solace in a three-letter question that has changed the way I think about all of these things about what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Because this three-letter question allows me to get at my heart, and my heart is the issue, not my behavior. God changes us from the inside out. So to crucify your flesh means I've gotta get at my heart. Well, how do I do that? Let me give you my secret question. It's the question, why? Why? So I ask, why? What is driving this behavior? Why am I angry right now? Why, what am I trying to achieve by doing this behavior? What am I trying to do by trying to control this other person? Why am I not willing to forgive this person? Why am I not willing to talk to this person? Why am I avoiding this situation? Why do I continue to pursue this habit? See, when I ask why, I begin to get at beyond my, beyond my shoulds, right? You should do this, you should do that, and now I get to what's really going on? Where am I trying to get something for myself that God has already given me? Why am I trying to control my world when God said he's sovereign and that I don't need to be anxious about anything? but trust him. Well, why am I still trying to do it? Because maybe I'm not trusting him. Do you see how that works? So in crucifying the flesh, I begin to ask myself why, and I begin to look at those ways that I'm actually sabotaging. Why am I I going to church every week? Why am I reading my Bible? Speak about it on a positive way. Ask yourself why. And you'll find that many reasons that you might do some of the Christian things are because you've always done them or because that's the way you were raised, or that's what a good Christian person does. Instead of saying, no, the reason I'm reading my Bible is I need to hear from God because I'm living by his spirit, and so I need to be informed on who he's made me to be. 
and I need to know what, he, what it looks like when I begin living out who he's made me to be. So we crucify the flesh. And thirdly, we walk in the spirit. We walk in the spirit. Now, it's a process. Look at verse 22 again. But the fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. The fruit of the spirit. Notice earlier in, in Galatians 5, he says the acts of the flesh. See, those are actions, but not when it comes to the Spirit. He's not talking about actions. He's talking about fruit. Well, I know it's probably hard to tell looking at me, but I'm not a green thumb. I don't do a lot of planting. In fact, Amy does most of that in our house. She takes care of the plants and has known to kill a few, but she's trying, you know. Way to go. But I'm, I just stay away from it completely. But I do know a little bit. I know that if I want to plant tomatoes in my backyard and I put a tomato seed in the ground, I know that I can't show up the next day looking to enjoy some tomatoes with my cheeseburger. Why? Because I planted the seed yesterday. And it's going to be a while, right? So the fruit of the Spirit, he says, on purpose, it's a fruit. Meaning meaning it is going to take time. It's a process. Well, how does fruit grow? Well, we have to cultivate the environment for the fruit to grow, right? We need to make sure we have the right soil. We need to make sure that it's getting enough water and not too much water. We need to make sure that it's getting enough sunlight. It needs to have the right conditions and given the right environment, cultivating the right environment, that fruit is going to grow and I'm going to get to enjoy my tomato or my banana or whatever it is that I planted, right? And so he says the fruit of the Spirit is, the, is a fruit, meaning it's going to take some time. You're going to need to look at your environment and say, am I setting myself in a place where the Spirit of God can have free reign in my life? Where the Spirit of God can allow me to see more and more of love and joy. And by the way, this isn't a list of pick the ones you like. This is the fruit of the Spirit. He doesn't say the fruits of the Spirit. Meaning they grow together. So to say, I'm really good at the fruit of love, but I'm really bad at the fruit of peace. That's, that, that, that's legalism again. What, what Paul is saying is it's the fruit of the Spirit meaning it's going to grow together or it doesn't grow at all. So if you're good at one thing and not good at another thing, you've got to ask yourself, is this really the spirit I'm cultivating or is this my behavior that I'm modifying? And then lastly, to walk in the spirit means I align myself with the spirit. Look at verse 25. Since we live by the spirit, let us keep in step with the spirit. That word in step with the spirit in the original language, the Greek, it speaks of this idea of soldiers marching in unison together. And so when he says keep in step with the Spirit, he's saying, I don't go this way and invite God over here. I look at where God is and I look to align myself with God's direction for my life. I keep in step with the Spirit. I Meaning I don't run ahead of the Spirit. Hey, come on, God, let's go. This is gonna be great. And I don't lag behind. I don't know, God. You really? Nah. You couldn't. Really? No. I don't need to talk to them. I don't need to invite my neighbor to Buddy Powell Fun Family Day. Come on, you know. I, I, come on, God. You know, just, you go and do that. Like, that's for those people. And I'll catch up. No, you keep in step with the Spirit. You align yourself with the Spirit of God. And then... The freedom of God is what you and I get to experience day in and day out because I choose to live my life in alignment with the Spirit of God. So here's our big idea today. Pretty simple to say, not so simple to maybe apply, and that is to live free in the Spirit. To live free in the Spirit. So, Let's be honest with ourselves for a minute and ask ourselves, in what areas of my life right now 
Am I not free? In what areas of my life am I still trying to earn my way to God, trying to be good enough, trying to do all the right things and be a good man or a good woman or a good kid or a bad kid, I mean a, a good, good boy or a good girl? Where are you maybe imprisoned by perfectionism or people-pleasing or trying to earn grace instead of receive grace? Or maybe for you, you can say pretty honestly to yourself that maybe there's some areas of your life where you're indulging your flesh. And maybe you're like, yeah, I know, I got this habit, I just can't let it go. And I'm, I'm, I'm using this habit, I'm going in this direction to do something for me that God's already giving me. I'm trying to control my world when God's already sovereign. I'm, already, I'm trying to, to make more money and, and provide for my security when God says I'm secure in his love. And so I'm indulging my flesh, working crazy hours, or stuck with habits that I'm just like, I have to do this thing, and I don't know how to break free from it. And you're not experiencing the freedom that Christ set you free for. So I want you to take a second. I want you to think about in what area of my life right now am I not experiencing the fullness of, of the freedom of God. The freedom that he came to give me. In what area of, of your life is that not happening? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And as I pray, I want to pray for many of you who are right now struggling, maybe imprisoned, maybe being held back, missing out on what God has for you. And so if you can identify something in your mind right now where you're like, I know that I'm not experiencing the fullness. And, you, and I'm not going to ask you what area it is. Maybe it is legalism. Maybe it is you, you've kind of got caught in that performance trap. Maybe it is people pleasing. Maybe it is you're worried. You try to control. Maybe it's something in your flesh that you're indulging and you find yourself imprisoned by it. But if that's you today, I'm just going to ask you to stand to your feet. Everyone's eyes are closed and head bowed. But if you say, Jason, that's me. I'm not experiencing the fullness of freedom. And would you pray for me? Because I want to experience that. So if that's to you, you today, with everyone's eyes closed, would you stand to your feet and say, Jason, pray for me. I want to be free. I want to experience that kind of freedom that God has. Is there anyone? As the Spirit moves. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? And Lord God, as people continue to stand, I'm going to ask you right now, in the name of Jesus, by your power, Lord, you see those who are standing. And you see those maybe who are even afraid of what will people think if I stand. And I pray right now for courage for that person to say yes, Jesus. This is not about anybody else. This is about you and me, God. This is about me doing business with you, getting right with you today, laying it down, letting it go. Lord, for those who are standing right now, I pray that you would move in their lives, that you would move in their hearts. God, that you would help them to experience what it means to be set free, to have the chains of slavery just break away so that they could live in the fullness of what it means to follow Jesus fully. Because Lord God, you are the chain breaker. You are the one who sets us free so that we can experience you and life in your spirit. So we look forward, God, to what you're gonna do in each and every life as we wrestle through these concepts. May they honor, bring honor and glory to who you are. And now I'm gonna ask the rest of you to stand around everyone. We're going to all stand together and let's worship God through a song that's probably new to a lot of you. It's called Chain Breaker. Sing it as you pick it up. <laughs>